In young earth creationist theology, there are three key components, three elements without which the entire system falls to pieces. The first of these has to do with the Genesis creation days. The six days of Genesis, according to young earth creationists, absolutely must be six literal 24 hour calendar days. Number two, originally God's entire creation was perfect and then man sinned. After man sinned, Man not only came under the curse of death himself, but the entire creation entered into a cursed state, with the result that death now applies to all living things. All death, all suffering, everything we see in this universe that is in any way negative is directly related to the fall of man. Number three, the flood of Noah, as described in Genesis, was a global event a worldwide catastrophe that reshaped the entire surface of the planet and killed every living thing on the earth apart from Noah, his family, and the animals that they took with them on the ark. Now, because young earth creationists link all death and turmoil in nature to the fall of man, including animal death, they must have some mechanism by which to explain the fossil record and also the various evidences of geological upheaval in the earth's primordial past. A global flood in which all humans and animals died apart from those on the ark and during which the surface of the earth was extensively resurfaced and various geologic layers were laid down is the only explanatory mechanism readily available to them. For this reason, the global flood model has become a sort of lint trap for young earth teachers, a catch-all by which they've attempted to explain everything from the fossil record to radioactive decay rates to the breakup of the continents to craters on the moon. Indeed, the scope of what the flood is thought to account for from the young earth perspective is truly staggering. Any question that you can ask a young earth creationist, almost anything you can think of, will eventually end up being tied back somehow to Noah's flood. You want to know how the Grand Canyon got there? It was formed by Noah's flood. In fact, young earth creationists offer tours of the Grand Canyon where they uh, show off the various rock layers and formations there and try to advocate for the idea that the flood created these things in a very short period of time, not over millions of years as mainstream science suggests, but over a period of weeks and months during the year of Noah's flood. Do you want to know how the dinosaurs died? Mainstream scientists will tell you it was primarily due to an asteroid impact that occurred about 65 million years ago, which rendered the climate of the Earth unsuitable for them, and most of them died off after that. Uh, young Earth creationists will dispute this, saying, no, this absolutely cannot be. Why is that? Because we find death and disease in the fossil record, millions of years worth of these things. And this just can't be the work of a good God who pronounced his creation very good. No, this must instead be a result of the fall of man. And since man was created only a few thousand years ago, well, dinosaurs couldn't possibly have lived uh, millions of years ago. They must have been created thousands of years ago. And they must have lived alongside man and they all must have perished together in the flood again except for those that were on the ark and young earth creationists will tell you that noah probably did take dinosaurs on the ark here's a picture of some t-rexes in cages at the ark encounter from uh, answers in genesis there at the creation museum the ark encounter in uh, lexington kentucky so they're very serious about this issue they'll tell you that dinosaurs survived for uh, thousands of years after the flood that the behemoth and leviathan described in the biblical book of Job are probably dinosaurs and they'll tell and some of them at least will speculate that there may even be dinosaurs alive on the earth today and animals that we refer to as cryptids things that are not uh, confirmed to science yet uh, like the Loch Ness Monster and that sort of thing so the importance of a global flood in young earth creationist theology simply cannot be understated from what I've seen, they have spilled more ink over this issue, devoted more documentary time, and spent more time in uh, public lectures and that sort of thing, in online presentations on promoting the idea that the Genesis Flood was in fact a global event that took place only a few thousand years ago. They have spent more time fighting for this idea and trying to impress this idea on people than any single other issue in young earth creationist theology indeed i remembered that one of the very first movies i ever saw in church growing up back in the 70s was a film called the world that perished and that was dedicated to promoting the uh, young earth global flood idea so
in getting into this, this is definitely a Vietnam they're willing to fight. This is a hill they're willing to die on. And the reason for it is very simple. With most of these issues that we've been talking about in uh, the creation debate, uh, for instance, the days of Genesis, the extent of the fall of Adam, exactly what happened, when, whether there's a curse on creation and all that sort of thing. When we're talking about most of those things, we're going back and forth on theological issues. We're breaking down a textual matter. We're exegeting. We're debating scripture. But when it comes down to something like a global flood, if such a thing happened, it would have undoubtedly left its impression, its mark all over the globe. There should be abundant evidence that it took place, especially if it happened only a few thousand years ago. And so for young earth creationists, this creates the opportunity for them to demonstrate that their interpretations actually have validity in the real world. This is where their theological rubber meets the physical road. This is how they try to demonstrate that what they're arguing for is plausible, that this is the best explanation, in fact, for the things that we see around us. And they're very adamant in these claims. Most of the time, they simply state it as an incontrovertible fact and then move on. So for this reason, this is going to be one of the more important videos in this series, I think. We're going to do a deep dive on the issue. As usual, we'll be looking at it from the scriptural angle rather than from any scientific considerations. I will mention a couple considerations about the scientific debate at the very end of the video, but as I've been doing all along, I want to focus on what the scripture says, on what the Genesis text says, because this is really where the heart of the debate lies. I realize this has been an extensive introduction to the subject, but I really wanted to lay out what's at stake here and why it's important. So moving right along now, welcome to part 14 in my series on the creation controversy dealing with the flood of Noah. The story of the flood spans Genesis chapter 6 through 9, which I cannot quote in their entirety here. Instead, I will quote the most prominent passages young earth teachers use to make the case for their global flood model, all but one of which are taken from those chapters. Afterwards, I will break down some of the elements that I find in these passages and offer a few observations I consider illuminating. Now we'll start here with Genesis chapter 6 and verse 13. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh is before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Moving on, Genesis 6, verse 18. Behold, I, even I, am bringing a flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. Moving on to Genesis 7, 4. For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. Genesis 7:17 7, to 23 Then the flood came upon the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark, so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed fifteen cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. All flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth. And all mankind, of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left, together with those that were with him in the ark. Genesis 8, 9. Then he, Noah, sent out a dove to see if the water was low on the surface of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of its foot. So it returned to him in the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. 2 Peter 2, 5. And God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Genesis 8, 1 through 5. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. Also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained. And the water receded steadily from the earth. 
and at the end of 150 days the water decreased. In the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. The water decreased steadily until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Now, having read these passages, at first glance, it's easy to understand why so many Christians accept the global flood model and marvel at anyone who doesn't. The language employed in these passages seems all-inclusive. The whole earth is said to have been covered with water, including the high mountains, and every living thing on the land is said to have died. Now, I'll get into breaking these details down shortly in order to illustrate for you how an alternative reading of the text and an alternative flood model can be understood. In the meantime, however, I'd like you to compare the passages that we just read, how they describe the flood, to the model that young earth creationists usually use when they articulate their global flood interpretation. To make this a little easier, I have broken down 10 elements of the flood account as we find them in the book of Genesis. And I'll just go through them real quick here before we get into how young earth creationists present the flood. First of all, Genesis tells us that the windows of heaven were opened. We understand this as simply meaning that it began to rain. Secondly, the fountains of the great deep were broken up. No one is sure exactly what this means. You'll find out that young earth creationists have their speculation on it, but it may simply mean that large bodies of water overflowed their banks. In the ancient Near East, uh, given the cosmology that they had, they believed that certain large bodies of water went down beneath the earth as part of what they called the great deep or the great abyss, like a, an ocean underneath all the land masses of the earth. So that may simply be all this means. Third, rain fell for 40 days and 40 nights. Fourth, the water level rose steadily. Fifth, the ark floated on the surface of the water. Sixth, God sent a wind to drive the waters back. Seventh, the windows and fountains were stopped up. Eight, the water began to recede slowly. Nine, the tops of the mountains became visible. Tenth, everything eventually dried out. This is how Genesis presents the flood. This is just how the biblical text lays it out. Now let's compare that description of the flood to descriptions that young earth creationists typically appeal to in their global flood model. Genesis 7:11 says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were open. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. This means that the water came from two sources, from the fountains of the deep and two from the floodgates of the sky. It appears the continental plates were shifted and the continents formed when the fountains of the deep opened and the water gushed out. It's also believed that the water canopy God created at creation came down upon the earth. Then, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. These two events, the fountains of the great deep breaking up and the windows of heaven opening, began the first day of a 371 day long calamity that resurfaced the earth and killed everything that moved on land. Hot magma mixed with steam pierced the earth's crust. Giant rifts or tears ran thousands of miles across the planet. Scalding hot magma vaporized massive amounts of water that jetted into the atmosphere. The water fell back to Earth as intense global rain, along with torrential rain from heaven for 40 days. Worldwide catastrophic rifting caused massive mud-filled tsunamis to speed across deep ocean floors, then onto shallow ocean floors, killing everything in their path. The first mega sequence wipes out mostly shallow marine habitats. The bursting fountains of the great deep spew out megatons of magma and carbon dioxide. Then by the 40th day of the flood, the Apsorica mega sequence began hitting. The maps show that this is when things got much worse. Something shoves the water over the tops of even the high lands from that ancient world. The newly forming ocean floor offshore is so hot that it starts very thick, pushing up the ocean waters from beneath. Sea level rises dramatically. Molten magma rises and fills the widening gaps, pushing the mid-ocean ridges wider. The distant, colder ocean floor shoves against the continents, then slides beneath them like giant conveyor belts deep beneath the earth in some places. Rather than the conventional model that has the seafloors spreading slowly, this runaway subduction actually happened quickly 
moving at about 5 miles per hour due to the heat caused by the friction and pressure of the rapidly subducting plates. As the diving ocean floor plates subduct under the land, they push down the continental edges and then release them, creating tsunami cycles that blanket the continents. Just how tsunamis happen today, only more intense and frequent. When God stopped the fountains of the great deep on day 150, the new ocean surface began cooling and sinking, allowing the floodwaters to lower as they sheeted off the continents into the new ocean basins. Psalm 104 describes the mountains being raised at the end of the flood and the waters draining down valleys and off the emerging new land surfaces. Even more spectacular, huge underground reservoirs spewed forth. All the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Ocean basins uplifted. There were enormous explosions, releasing tremendous amounts of molten rock and steam. The waters continue to rise until six weeks later, the flood reached its maximum mountain covering depth and this depth was maintained for 110 days until the waters had destroyed every living thing on the platforms except those on the ark who were special recipients of God's loving care. The final phase of the flood episode begins in Genesis chapter 8 where we read, God made a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained and the waters returned from off the earth continued. The formation of the ocean basins is among the most perplexing questions to geologists. Equally perplexing is the uplifting of the mountains as evidenced by the many and changing theories. Students of flood geology point to the supernatural character of their origin in Psalm 104, which reads, The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place which thou didst establish for them. Thou didst set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. Thus, the Bible implies that at the same time the land was being lifted up, the ocean basins were caused to sink. Okay, now folks, I wanted you to see that, not just hear the narration, but I wanted to actually show you the video as well, so that you could see the graphics, the illustrations that young earth creationists use, in addition to their narration, to demonstrate how they think a global flood must have taken place. This is the imagery they want you to have in your mind as you think about Noah's flood and as you think about how the earth got to be in the condition that it's in today. Young earth creationists are in the unenviable situation of having to explain hundreds of millions of years worth of earth changes in a very short amount of time. And the only catastrophe mentioned in scripture that gives them a chance to try to accommodate that is the flood of Noah. So naturally they have to take all of this, all of this history that we have of earth changes, again, over hundreds of millions of years, according to mainstream science, they have to compress that all down into the one in one year of the flood. And actually less than that. Many times they'll tell you that a lot of these changes took place over weeks and months. And when you break the flood down, according to the young earth um, interpretation, you really end up with two disasters. You have the initial flooding of the earth and all the changes that took place then. But at the end of the flood, there's also more catastrophe. You have the recession of the flood waters and that supposedly redistributes sediments again, the mountains rise, the continents lower, that sort of thing. So you really have two disasters in one here. And that's how they account for everything. And it's the only way that they can do it. And I wanted you to see that. And I wanted you to contrast that with the biblical flood account as we read it in the Genesis text. I don't know about you folks, but as far as I'm concerned, it's apples and oranges. The biblical flood, the flood of Noah, as it's described 
in the text of Genesis is downright mild compared to what young earth creationists portray in their flood model. Their flood model has more in common with disaster films, apocalypse movies like 2012, and what happens in that movie, the disasters on floods and that sort of thing. It has more in common with that, with Hollywood disaster films, than it does with how Noah's flood is described in the text of scripture, where basically water goes up and water goes down. The ark floats on top, the ark runs aground. That's really about it. Everything else, that they incorporate in their flood model is extra biblical. They impose it on the text. And that is extremely important because young earth creationists consistently portray themselves as the champions of biblical authority. They are always the ones scolding people for, as they say, adding to the word of God, imposing things on scripture, trying to force millions of years into the text and scientific assumptions and all that sort of thing. But that's exactly what they're doing here because the way they describe the flood is almost completely extra biblical. You don't read anything in Genesis six through nine about continents breaking up and tsunamis washing over everything, blasting out canyons and all that sort of thing. You don't read about magma and steam rising up into the atmosphere or some sort of canopy surrounding the earth collapsing to the earth. You don't read about an ice age. You read about none of that. They impose those things on the text, or they would say probably that they simply derive those things as reasonable, given what must have happened at the time. If folks, number one, it isn't reasonable, not even close. There are numerous problems with their global flood model. And I'll talk more about that in the next video in this series, where I get into a close look at the book, Thousands, Not Billions, which was one of the elements that finally helped drive the last nail into the young earth creationist coffin in my own thinking as I was reevaluating this issue. But secondly, it isn't necessary either. Now it is for young earth creationists because again, they have to account for all of these earth changes and everything that we see in the biblical flood is the only event in scripture that gives them anything resembling a biblical basis for doing so. So they've simply got no choice but to go big or go home there. But if you look at the biblical account of the flood in light of the overall text of scripture, and that's what I'm going to get into here, another case becomes readily apparent for the flood as a regional, a local type of event, a massive event, a catastrophic event, yes, but limited in scope. And this makes perfect sense in light of what we read in scripture. And we don't end up with the absurdities that we end up with in a global flood model as young earth creationists have to have it. So that will be the focus of the rest of this video. Let's go ahead and get into the case. Now, first of all, we have to understand the issue of context and perspective in the context. When we see the phrase in the biblical text, all flesh that moved on the earth perished. This sounds to us as if the text is saying that every living thing on the planet died. This is because when we use the term earth, we almost invariably mean it as a synonym for planet Earth, meaning the whole globe. And we unconsciously read this understanding into scripture. But the Genesis flood account was not written by a modern English speaker with a global mindset informed by modern science. As I've demonstrated previously, the Hebrew word Eretz, which is translated Earth in the phrase, all flesh that moved on the Earth perished, simply means land and often refers to a particular land, such as the land of Israel or the land of Egypt. This is common usage in scripture. You can find this over and over again in biblical study materials. In order to make their case, global flood proponents need to prove that, at least within the context of this narrative in Genesis 6 through 9, land, Eretz, really means the entire land mass of the planet. Now, global flood advocates may say, what reason is there to believe that it doesn't? God clearly says that the flood will come upon the whole earth and all flesh will die. This is all inclusive language that makes no sense if the flood didn't really cover the whole world and kill everything that wasn't on the ark. Now, in response here, I have pointed out previously in this series that language in scripture that appears to be all inclusive on the surface cannot be read in such a woodenly literal manner without reducing to absurdity or outright contradiction. I gave you some examples of this. Now, just to recap, including for those of you who may not have seen previous videos in this series, I'll just 
go over them very quickly, give you a few prominent examples. Ezra 1, 2 records a proclamation that Cyrus, king of Persia, sent out to his kingdom concerning the rebuilding and repopulating of Jerusalem. In it, he says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Would anyone think that this is literally true as we understand it today? Did Cyrus rule over the entire globe? The Persians were intelligent people. They knew very well that there were lands and peoples beyond their dominion. The word translated earth in this passage is once again Eretz, literally land. What land? The land of Persia. In his proclamation, Cyrus was simply saying that God had allowed him to consolidate the rule of Persia over territory once controlled by numerous independent kingdoms. He wasn't claiming global hegemony here. We see similar phraseology in Daniel 4, where Nebuchadnezzar relates a dream and the events that followed it in a proclamation to his people. He begins as Cyrus does in Ezra 1 by establishing his authority in hyperbolic language. He says, quote, Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, unquote. That's Daniel 4, 1. The word translated earth here is hara, the Aramaic counterparts heretz, and it simply means land. What land? The land controlled by Babylon, which consisted of numerous conquered kingdoms. In his dream, Nebuchadnezzar saw himself symbolized as a great tree that was, quote, visible to the end of the whole earth, unquote, or in other words, stretched as far as the eye could see. You read that in Daniel 4.11. Of this tree, Nebuchadnezzar says, its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the sky, of the sky dwelt in its branches. And all living creatures, literally flesh, fed themselves from it, as Daniel 4.12. In interpreting that dream, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, It is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong, and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky, and your dominion to the end of the earth. That's Daniel 4.22. There's language, again, uh, used in Daniel chapter 2, verses 37 to 38, that is even more striking, where Daniel says this, You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. Now, Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel knew quite well that there were lands, people, and animals beyond the dominion of Babylon. Yet, to the modern reader, the language they used in these passages makes it sound as if nothing exists apart from Babylon, that Babylon rules the entire land mass of the earth. Now, that sort of phraseology is found over and again throughout the scriptures. It's very common in ancient literature. It's hyperbolic language used to exalt the king, to praise and honor the king, and to extol the power of the kingdom, that sort of thing. I gave you other examples of this as well. Again, very quickly, uh, 1 Samuel 22, 2, the text tells us everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to David, and he became a captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. As I noted previously, it seems unlikely that there were only 400 or so discontented persons in all of Israel, that all of them were men and all of them chose to join David. Now, moving into the New Testament, Mark 1, 4 through 5, we're told John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now, did every single person in Judea, including Jerusalem, repent and undergo the baptism of John? Luke chapter 7, verses 29 to 30 indicate that, quote, the Pharisees and lawyers rejected God's purposes for themselves, not having been baptized by him, that is John, unquote. Later in John 3, 36, John's disciples tell John the Baptist that Jesus is now baptizing and, quote, all are going to him, unquote. Yet according to verse 35, John was still baptizing as well. So clearly not everyone who was going to be baptized was going to Jesus. Some were still going to John. And we see, again, examples and examples of this type of thing. This is hyperbole used in context for the sake of emphasis. Uh, John 1, 11 through 12, he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become the children of God. John 3, 32 to 33, what he has seen and heard of that he testifies and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. Now, in those passages, John first tells us that no one received Christ or his testimony, but then goes on to describe those who did, in fact, receive Christ and his testimony. Now, this is a form of emphasis, again, meant to indicate that for the most part, Christ and his message were rejected, but they were not rejected by everyone. Both of these instances of hyperbole, this hyperbolic language, appear in narrative form. 
here in the Gospels. The last example I'll give you at this point is uh, Luke 2, 1 and 3, the famous example of the census of Caesar Augustus. Luke writes, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth, and everyone was on his way to the census. Now, as we saw with reference to the empires of Persia and Babylon, it seems clear that the whole Roman world is indicated here, potentially, rather than the entire inherited, inhabited globe. Uh, archaeological research into this issue, however, seems to make it doubtful that there was a empire-wide census at that time. It just doesn't seem to have happened. It's possible then that this was a census that applied to the land of Judea and may have been even more localized than that at that particular time. It could not, however plainly could not have included the entire inhabited globe. No one from China or Indonesia or South America would have been included in this census. And no one takes that idea seriously. Yet, if you read this in a straightforward, woodenly literal manner, the text could be read that way. It also seems to read as if everyone in the Roman Empire was law-abiding and obeyed the decree, which is rather unlikely. Now, those were the recap examples of things we looked at previously. Let's go ahead and move on in the text and look at some where the language is even more comparable to what we read in the Genesis flood account. In Zephaniah 1, 1 through 3, the Lord makes a very interesting pronouncement in the days of Josiah, king of Judah. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will remove human and animal life. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. And I will eliminate mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. The phrase theology used here immediately puts one in mind of the flood account. God is saying he will remove mankind from the earth and will even kill the animals that inhabit it as well. But then consider what follows this decree in verse 4. So I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will eliminate the remnant of Baal or Baal from this place. The sweeping destruction God promises here is specifically directed against the land of Judah in retribution for its idolatry. The prophet Jeremiah also employs similar language in his descriptions of the judgment God was about to bring on Judah in those days. Reading here from Jeremiah 4, 23 to 27. I looked at the earth and behold, it was a formless and desolate emptiness and to the heavens and they had no light. I looked to the mountains and behold, they were quaking and all the hills jolted back and forth. I looked and behold, there was no human and all the birds of the sky had fled. I looked and behold, the fruitful land was a wilderness and its cities were pulled down before the Lord, before his fierce anger. For this is what the Lord says, the whole land shall be a desolation, yet I will not execute a complete destruction." Then Jeremiah 9, verses 10 through 11, I will take up a, way, a weeping and wailing for the mountains and for the pastures of a wilderness of a song of mourning, because they are laid waste so that no one passes through, and the sound of livestock is not heard. Both the birds of the sky and the animals have fled, they are gone. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals. Now, the word translated earth in Zephaniah 1, verse 2 and 3 is Adama, which is the same word used in Genesis chapter 7, verse 4, where God says to Noah, I will wipe out from the face of the land, Adama, every living thing I have made. The word translated earth in Jeremiah 4.23, where Jeremiah says he looked upon the earth and found no man, and in chapter 4, verse 27, where God says the whole land shall be a desolation, is once again the by now familiar word Eretz. Notice how similar the sweeping language of these passages is to the language used in the flood account. At first glance, it seems that the text is telling us that God is going to kill everyone on the earth, even all the animals as well. But then other verses demonstrate that the earth spoken of is specifically the land of Judah, not the entire land mass of the planet we call earth. Notice also the use of hyperbole here, the mountains quaking and the hills jolting back and forth. So, young earth creationists may say, if God meant for Hadama and Eretz to apply in a similar limited context in Genesis chapter 6 through 9, where the flood is described, why didn't he specify this in some way, as he did in Zechariah and Jeremiah? Well, for one thing, if the earth, as Noah knew it, was limited to a given inhabited area, it would have been unnecessary for God to specify anything. The world, as Noah knew it, was about to perish. On another front, consider that God really speaks very little in the flood account compared to his speeches in the prophecies of Zechariah and Jeremiah. 
In fact, when you think about it, the entire flood account is really rather cursory. Noah spent years building the ark and the flood itself lasted for nearly a year. Yet all of this is summarized in less than four full chapters. Clearly, Genesis 6 through 9 are conveying the highlights of the flood and the events that led up to it. God may very well have said much more to Noah than is recorded in the Genesis account. Now, for an example from Genesis itself, consider, consider Genesis 13, 9, where Abraham, who was concerned about disputes arising between his herdsmen and those of his nephew Lot, tells Lot that they should separate. Abraham says to him, Is the entire land not before you? Please separate from me. If you choose the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you choose the right, then I will go to the left. In Hebrew, the phrase, the entire land, is kol eretz, which is the same wording used in Genesis 8-9, where Noah's dove returns to him because, quote, the water was on the surface of the whole earth, unquote. Do we really think that Abraham had the far reaches of the globe in mind when he asked Lot to pick a place for grazing his flocks and herds? The idea seems absurd. Why, then, must the same words automatically mean the entire globe in Genesis 13, verse 9? For one last example, consider 1 Samuel 14, 25, which tells of a time when Israel pursued the Philistines under King Saul. Quote, all the people of the land entered the forest, and there was honey on the ground. Unquote. In Hebrew, the phrase, all the people of the land, is kol eretz, literally, all the land. Now, I quoted this from the New American Standard Bible, and the translators there chose to render the meaning of this particular passage rather than the author's exact wording as all the land entered the forest makes for a rather awkward reading. Clearly, people are in view here, not a moving landmass. Yet even the phrase all the people can refer only to the army of Israel. It certainly could not be extended to everyone in the world, nor even to everyone in Israel, unless we're prepared to believe that every man, woman, and child in Israel was part, was part of Saul's army, and that the cities of the land lay empty while everyone pursued the Philistines into the forest en masse. So again, I will ask this. Given the clearly limited usage of the same Hebrew terms, why must we automatically believe that Kol Eretz in Genesis 13, 9 refers to the entire globe? How can we look at examples from the proclamations of Cyrus and Nebuchadnezzar and the response given by Daniel and what the text tells us about the men who went to side with King David and the examples we see even in the New Testaments concerning the, uh, the ministry of Jesus and the Roman census and all this sort of thing? How can we look at all of this sweeping, all-inclusive language that simply cannot be read in a literal fashion without it reducing to absurdity and then just go back to Genesis and say, well, six through nine here, chapter six through nine, um, that doesn't apply. None of that applies here. This has got to be the entire planet. Why? Really, folks, there's really no other reason than because young earthers need it to be the entire planet. Their theology doesn't work without it. Now then, just as we must clarify what Luke meant when he referred to the whole world going to be taxed, we should ask what Noah would have thought of as Kol Eretz when he was told that the flood was coming upon it. It strains credulity here to believe that Noah had a modern understanding of the world, and certainly nothing in the text itself suggests this. When he first heard the phrase, the whole land, Noah would not have conceived of a globe as we do today. In all likelihood, he had no knowledge of anything beyond the Mesopotamian region. Furthermore, scripture does not tell us how far mankind had migrated by that time. But there are several reasons to believe that humans, or at least those of the Adamic line, had not spread across the entire landmass of the planet in Noah's day. And if you want to know what I mean by the entire Adamic line, please go back and watch uh, the previous videos in this series where I discuss the origins of humanity. Throughout history, human beings have gathered together in communities in order to share responsibilities and reap mutual benefits. Isolated persons and family groups are especially vulnerable to the hazards of life, and survival is much more difficult for them. This is true even today, but was all the more so in ancient times. In those times, exile from one's community often had the effect of being a death sentence. Our densely populated and conveniently ordered modern world is an anomaly in human experience. In the past, the average population of the Earth was much lower, and vast portions of the planet were uninhabited or only sparsely inhabited. Even today, there are large regions of the Earth where communities are few and far between, and life in such places is more exacting and hazardous. The idea of living off the land is a romantic notion that may occasionally appeal to disenchanted urbanites, but in reality it's a very difficult lifestyle, suitable only for the hardiest and most determined among us.
In the pre-technological antediluvian world, the struggle for survival would have been difficult enough for man, but it was made even more difficult by the curse God had placed on the ground. In Genesis 5.29, Noah's father, Lamech, promises that Noah will, quote, give us comfort from our work and from the hard labor of our hands caused by the ground which the Lord has cursed, unquote. The tone of this passage suggests that the curse did indeed have a strong stifling effect on man's productivity and civilization. Given this, the impetus to gather together in close communities would have been even stronger among mankind in those days. Striking out on one's own would have been a threat to survival simply due to the difficulty of food cultivation, to say nothing of safety considerations, as Genesis 6.11 tells us that the earth was filled with violence at that time. Identity may also have been a factor here. If there were indeed two populations of humans on earth, as I discussed previously, Adamites would probably have clustered together rather than dispersing among other communities of human beings, whom they may have looked upon as their inferiors. For these reasons, I'm doubtful that humans of Noah's day had strayed far from the Tigris and Euphrates river region. Fresh water was abundant there, cultivation of crops would have been easier, fish were readily available from the rivers, the climate of the region was stable, and there would have been greater safety in numbers. Disagreement and divisions of, fac of faction would likely have resulted in numerous communities springing up between these rivers and along their courses, but it probably wouldn't have provoked mass migrations to any great distance. There would have been little incentive to wander far. The risks and burdens involved would simply have been too great. In Genesis chapter 11, which recounts the Tower of Babel story, we're told that, quote, all the earth, unquote, settled in the land of Shinar and had to be scattered to other regions by an act of God. While this reference only comments on the habits of post-flood culture, it at least suggests that the people of this time period tended to congregate rather than to spread out. This makes sense for many reasons, as I've explained already, and it has been exemplified throughout human history as a consistent human tendency. There have always been nomads among us, but up until relatively recently, most people lived and died within a short distance of where they were born. Explorers have often been romanticized, but they have never been the norm. For one last thought here, consider that the Apostle Peter tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Many a Sunday school teacher has favored his or her class with the story of Noah preaching to scoffing, unbelieving crowds during the many years he spent building the ark. Again, another extra biblical um, a detail that's often added to this story. It's perfectly plausible to believe that the people of a limited region would have heard Noah's preaching, or at least heard of it. But it's far less plausible to believe that he went on a preaching tour of the world to reach isolated pockets of humanity with his warning of the coming judgment. Those living in far-flung regions of the world would thus have had no warning, no opportunity for repentance, no chance to get on the ark, at least from what we can see in the biblical text. There were no mass media outlets in those days, and if Noah and his family alone were righteous, who else was preaching the message? This seems like a problem to me. Now, all of these considerations bring us back to the question I originally posed. When God told Noah that the flood would come upon the whole earth and kill everything on it, what did Noah think that meant? What exactly was the earth to him? Was Noah's earth the entire land mass of the globe, or was it more along the lines of Luke's Roman world? Either definition could legitimately work here. If Noah knew nothing of the world beyond the Mesopotamian region, if that was in fact the inhabited world as he knew it, then yes, the flood could come upon the whole world, the whole earth, the whole land, and yet not cover the whole globe. This is even suggested by the Apostle Peter's wording when he tells us that the flood was sent, quote, upon the world of the ungodly, unquote. And that's in 2 Peter 2.5. The language Peter uses here suggests a limited judgment, one that wiped out a certain rebellious people. But, say the global flood theologians, you forget that God himself said that the flood would come upon the whole earth and wipe out all life. Even if Noah had a limited perspective of what constituted the earth, God knew the whole globe as it really was, and he inspired the Holy Spirit to convey that perspective in Scripture. In response to this objection, yes, God did tell Noah that the flood would come upon the whole earth. But as I've taken pains to point out in this series, God speaks to man on man's level, according to man's understanding. In communicating with us, he uses our language and our perspective. If Noah thought of the earth or the world only as the land and the people he was familiar with, as the Babylonians and Persians appear to have thought of it, or at least as the land under their domination, there is no reason to believe that God meant to convey anything else when he spoke to Noah. God knew perfectly well what Noah thought of as the world, and thus how Noah would understand it when he said this to him. To prove the global flood interpretation, it is necessary to demonstrate that both God and Noah intended kol eretz to mean the entire land mass of the planet, 
This would seem to be disproven by Genesis 8, 8 through 9, where Noah sends out a dove. The dove ultimately returns to him because it, quote, found no resting place for the sole of its foot, for the water was on the surface of all the earth, unquote. Yet if we read just a few verses earlier, we find that this was 40 days after the waters had receded enough for the tops of the mountains to become visible. Clearly, the earth here is a reference to plains, low-lying country, not all land everywhere. Just doesn't work otherwise. It becomes an absurdity or a contradiction. Furthermore, as discussed previously, it seems likely that Genesis was compiled from records handed down from previous generations. These records were written in the language of the ancients and necessarily from a human perspective. While I do accept that the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of Scripture, I do not hold to what some have called the dictation theory of inspiration. That is the idea that God effectively used the authors of Scripture as typewriters. The original author of the flood account, probably Noah or one of his sons, did not channel the Holy Spirit in the process of recording the event, nor did Moses when he compiled Genesis long afterward, or the editors who worked on it after him. As someone has correctly said, Scripture was written for us, but not to us. It was written to an ancient pre-scientific people, from a perspective, and in a language, they could understand. Consequently, it is not enough for global proponents, global flood proponents, excuse me, it's not enough for them to argue, this is God talking in the flood account. We must consider to whom God was talking and what he meant for that person to understand. If Noah thought of the earth and the world as the region where his civilization lay and was ignorant of anything beyond those areas, why would God mean anything else when using those terms and speaking to him? The burden of proof here is on global flood advocates to demonstrate that Noah's concept of the earth and the world are what we think of today as the planet and the globe. So what then do we make of statements like these in Genesis chapter 7 verses 19 through 20? The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed 15 cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. Global flood theorists have speculated that the mountains of Noah's time might not have been as high as those of today. But no matter how high they were, if the flood covered all of them, then it must have been a truly global deluge. At first glance, this seems like a definitive argument, or at least I thought so when I was a young earth creationist listening to lectures and watching films like The World That Perished. The following picture gives you an idea of how AIG mocks the local or regional flood interpretation, and that's sort of more or less what I thought of too when I was a young earth creationist. When you look at the Hebrew, however, this apparent slam dunk for the global flood theologians quickly evaporates. The Hebrew word translated mountains is har, which can refer to mountains of considerable height, but is often rendered as hill, hills, or hill country in Scripture. Thus, it does not have to mean mountains that are many hundreds or thousands of feet high. It could mean almost any area that is elevated above the surrounding land. There are also matters of perspective to consider here. For instance, consider that high is a rather subjective term. For people living in the comparatively flat terrain of Mesopotamia, the idea of a high place might mean something completely different than it would to an inhabitant of Tibet. This is similar to how people living in the western United States and Alaska often look at people living in the eastern United States and say that things like the Appalachians aren't really mountains. You want to see real mountains? Come out west, come up to Alaska, and we'll show you real mountains. There's a definite difference in perspective there. Furthermore, given that the flood account was passed down from those who were on the ark, it's reasonable to assume that they wrote from the perspective of what they personally witnessed. This means that the whole land, including the hill country, was covered with water as far as they could see from their vantage point. In an article for Old Earth Creationist Organization Reasons to Believe, Steve Sarjanus, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, in partnership with Hugh Ross, notes that given the dimensions for the ark as described in scripture, Noah's vantage point on top of the ark would have put him at about 30 feet above the water level and given him a horizon of about 8 miles, preventing him from seeing landforms even as high as 1,000 feet unless they were relatively close. Once again, it might be argued that we should believe that all the mountains of the world were covered because God inspired the writing of the text, so Noah didn't have to see it to know that it had happened. But this is once again assuming that the term Eretz and Kol Eretz, as used in the flood story, refer to the entire land mass of the planet. If they do not, then there is no difficulty with the idea that Noah simply recorded what he saw from his limited vantage point.
There is no reason to argue that inspiration somehow took the form of dictation here, using modern definitions of a planet and the landmass of the earth, that sort of thing. It could simply be that Noah was prompted to record his journey and did so from his perspective. I mean, when you think about it, how else would he have done it? Moving on to another issue that often arises with the global flood narrative. In Genesis 8, 1 through 3, we're told that the windows of heaven and the fountains of the deep were closed, and that God caused a wind to blow over the earth, with the result that the flood waters steadily receded from the earth. The Hebrew word translated receipt in this passage is shov, at least I think that's how it's pronounced, which Strong's defines as meaning to turn back, generally to retreat. The question that must be asked then is, where did the water recede to? Where did it retreat to? With a regional or local flood event, this poses no real problem. But with a global flood of any real depth, it becomes a serious issue. If the entire planet were essentially one large ocean, where would all of that water go? Where would there be for it to drain to? Young Earth teachers typically argue that tectonic activity during the flood raised the mountain ranges and lowered the ocean basins, which caused the water of the flood to drain off of the land and into the oceans. You saw a little bit of that in the video that I showed. As previously mentioned, however, there is no indication of this in the biblical text, which seems odd, especially if you hold to the dictation view of inspiration and believe that the ancients had a modern understanding of the globe. This theory is also extremely problematic from a scientific standpoint, as such massive tectonic activity over so short a period of time would have resulted in mega wave action, absolutely enormous, unbelievably enormous tsunamis that would have inundated the ark or smashed it to pieces. Global flood theologians may respond here that God could have miraculously protected the ark from such turbulence, and that's certainly true enough. But there are two problems with their argument as viewed from the text. First, as noted, the text says nothing about giant tsunamis washing over the world, or even mildly rough sailing for that matter. The text merely says that the water rose steadily and the ark floated on it. Second, the text actually hints that God did not supernaturally act to protect Noah during the time of the flood. Why? Well, because it wasn't necessary. He protected Noah from the flood by having him build a boat in which to ride it out, and this appears to have been entirely adequate by itself. Nothing in the description of the ark suggests that it was built to do anything more than stay afloat, and we should not infer that anything more was necessary for it to safeguard its cargo. Scripture does not give any indication whatsoever that the ark was built to survive the unimaginable turmoil of a planetary ocean stirred into a fury by the sudden reshaping of the earth's crust. This issue is really made unnecessary unless you go with a young earth global flood interpretation where you have to resurface the entire earth in less than a year. Then you have to account for all of these things. But just going by what we simply read in the Genesis text, it appears to me that all the ark had to do was stay afloat on the water. It didn't have to navigate incredibly heavy seas like we would have seen in a truly global flood event where everything is breaking up and the continents are shifting and all that sort of thing. And it's funny... Young Earth creationists, they depict the flood typically in, in artwork where you'll see the, the ark floating around. You'll see it in mostly calm seas. Every once in a while, you'll get a picture where there's some storminess going on. But I've only actually seen a couple pictures where the ark is depicted as having to deal with rough waters or any kind of conditions remotely close to what it would have had to have dealt with in a worldwide ocean where you've got tectonic breakup, driving wave action and that sort of thing. Most of the time it's just floating along rather nicely in some choppy seas maybe with some storminess going around. It's also interesting to me that modern depictions of the ark, including the way that Answers in Genesis chose to build their ark replica, it's designed like a sailing ship. It has the build of a vessel designed for deep water navigation. Yet there's nothing in the Genesis account about that. Nothing indicating that the Ark was designed to navigate or travel any great distance or anything like that. The way it's designed, the way the text reads, the Ark just seems like it just needs to stay afloat. So again, you've got all this being read into the Genesis text and I find that completely unnecessary apart from having to justify everything that uh, young earth creationists have to have with a global flood model. Now returning to the issue of where the waters went after the flood, unfortunately the text doesn't give us much to go on where the recession of the waters is concerned. It merely tells us that the windows or floodgates of heaven and the fountains of the deep were closed and that God caused a wind to blow over the earth until the flood waters had gone down and the land was dry. 
So all we can say for certain here is that the closing of the floodgates and the fountains stopped the influx of water, while the heaven sent wind caused the water to evaporate and or drove it back. The text tells us that the waters of the flood prevailed on the earth for 150 days, after which they finally began to subside and the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The tops of the mountains, of Ararat that is, then became visible 74 days later, almost two and a half months after the flood ceased. Another 96 days then passed before the text tells us that the earth was dry. Thus the recession of the water took a total of 170 days. For details on that, see Genesis 7.24 and chapter 8 verses 5 and 13. Now, if the global flood model is true and the mountains rose and the seabeds lowered to where we find them today during this time, thereby draining off the water from the flood, this alteration of the Earth's crust happened during the 170 days after the ark ran aground on the mountains of Ararat, because this is when the text says the water started to recede. The ark was resting on submerged earth by that time. Surely those on the ark would have felt the earth moving beneath them, but if they did, nothing is said of it in the account. To me, this seems extremely improbable. The text tells us that the water level went down, making the land visible. It does not say that the land rose up out of the water. Those are two entirely different things. Further, as already noted, the text attributes the recession of the floodwaters to the heaven-sent wind. If the mountains were rising and the seabeds lowering, the floodwaters would have drained off the land due to the tendency of water to seek the lowest level. The divine wind would only have been needed to dry the land out after the waters had withdrawn, but the text attributes the withdrawal of the floodwaters to the wind. Please make note of that. That's what the text says caused the waters to withdraw. The Bible doesn't tell us how deep the floodwaters were. The closest it comes to uh, to telling us something like this is Genesis 7, 19 through 20, where it says, The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed 15 cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. 15 cubits is, equal, is equivalent to approximately 23 feet. From the measurements described in Genesis, the ark stood approximately 50 feet high. Its draft, that is the distance from the ark's bottom or its keel to its water line, in other words, how low it sat in the water, would have been around 20 to 25 feet, leaving, there, leaving around 30 feet above water. Given these dimensions, when the ark ran aground, it was most likely in 20 to 25 feet of water, which matches up well with Genesis 7.20. As mentioned previously, it then took 74 days for the waters to recede to the point that Noah could see the tops of the mountains that the ark was resting on. This means that it took 74 days for the waters to decrease by 20 to 25 feet. That's a rate of about 4 inches per day, indicating not a precipitous decline, but a steady retreat. The water then took another 96 days to retreat from the surrounding land, only about 22% longer. The fact that the waters took 74 days to recede just 20 to 25 feet, even when assisted by a divine wind, makes it improbable that the ark came to rest on what we would consider true alpine country. Many young earth global flood believers think that the ark is located on Mount Ararat itself, somewhere above the 10,000 foot level. If the ark really were this high, however, should the waters not have drained quickly from the high mountain slopes as the ocean basins lowered? Also, remember the fact that once the tops of the mountains became visible, the water took an additional 96 days to drain from the surrounding country. So, to recap, it took 74 days from the time the ark ran aground for the tops of the mountains on which it rested to become visible, and then 96 more days until the rest of the surrounding land dried out, again, only about 22% longer. Although we cannot know the rate of drainage, whether it was steady or changed over time, these statistics tend to support a flood that was perhaps no more than 100 feet deep, and the ark running aground at an altitude that was not much greater than the surrounding plain. The time frames involved here are more consistent with a gentle rise and decrease of water rather than with anything precipitous, anything catastrophic which I would expect if shallow ocean basins suddenly lowered to their present average depth of three miles. If the latter were true, the land should have drained rapidly. The fact that the waters retreated so slowly indicates to me that the ocean depths and the mountain heights did not change appreciably during the flood. Again, if you're looking at a global event. If it's regional or local, this doesn't even apply. For these reasons, a global flood seems extremely improbable, given what we read in the text. The account is much more consistent with a regional disaster that inundated the plains, perhaps of Mesopotamia, and possibly even a larger area, and swept the ark north, where it finally came to rest in the lower foothills of the Ararat Range. 
A hilly area rising up about 100 feet would indeed seem mountainous to anyone who lived on the flat Mesopotamian plain. The Hebrew of the flood account allows for this interpretation, and the details of the account make it entirely plausible, if not, in fact, preferable. Now moving on, let's look at a few other areas of the biblical text that may help us discern the true nature of the flood, or at least give us a basis of comparison with the young earth creationist global flood model. The first area I'd like to go to is Psalm 104, which, as we saw previously, young earth creationists used to maintain that at the end of the flood, the, the mountains rose up and the ocean basins lowered, thus draining the water off of the land. And here's a bit of a recap from the film, The World That Perished. Students of flood geology point to the supernatural character of their origin in Psalm 104, which reads, The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place which thou didst establish for them. Thou didst set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. Thus, the Bible implies that at the same time the land was being lifted up, the ocean basins were caused to sink. Now let's take a look at Psalm 104 and see what it actually says and whether what's depicted in this film clip here is accurate. Reading in Psalm 104, verses 5 through 9, which the uh, narrator of the film read from, we find this. He, that is God, established the earth upon its foundation so that it will not move out of place forever and ever. You covered it with a deep sea as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. They fled from your rebuke. At the sound of your thunder, they hurried away. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place which you established for them. You set a boundary so that they will not pass over, so that they will not return to cover the earth. Now, folks, just looking at this, just right off the top of my head, what is the psalmist saying? He established the earth on its foundation so that it will not move out of place forever and ever, covered it with the deep sea as with a garment. This is a reference to creation. I don't read anything here about judgment. You don't see anything in here about Noah. There's nothing here about God wiping anybody out, anything like that. It's talking about the establishment of the earth. This is going back to the Genesis creation week, to the first few days of the creation week in Genesis 1. Initially, remember, the earth is without form and void and darkness is over the face of the deep. The waters are covering the land. They covered the land completely. And then God speaks and he does several things. First, separating light from darkness. And then he creates a space in the firmament on the second day. On the third day, he calls for the waters to be the waters under the heavens, that is, to be gathered to one place and for the dry land to appear. This is a clear reference back to the creation week. This has nothing to do with Noah's flood. In fact, if you go through the rest of the psalm, you'll find that this is even more clear. The psalmist is praising the Lord for the creation, for his majesty, for all the things that he's done. Uh, we read on in verse 10, he sends forth springs in the valleys. They flow between the mountains. They give drink to every beast of the field. He causes grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of man so that he may bring forth food from the earth. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The cliffs are a refuge for the Shephanim. And he goes on and on and on. In verse 24, O Lord, how many are your works? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. There is the sea, great and broad, in which there are swarms without number. And he just goes on praising the Lord for the way that he has made everything and ordered everything. Psalm 104 is a creation psalm. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the flood. And I think it's about time that young earth creationists stop appealing to this. Moving on to another item of potential interest here. Previously, I discussed a mysterious, violent race of people known as the Nephilim and offered some speculation on the issue of who they may have been with relation to human origins. Now, one of the things I noted was the Genesis chapter 6, which is the story of the sons of God coming in to sire children with the daughters of men, tells us that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, meaning when that happened. But it also mentions that they were there afterward, also afterward. Indeed, the Israelite spies sent into Canaan by Moses complained of seeing Nephilim in the land at that time. You can read about that in Numbers 33.13. Global flood theologians have a potential problem here, given that by their interpretation of Genesis 6-9, through 9, no one apart from Noah and his family survived the flood. 
It has been suggested that new Nephilim may have been spawned in the years after the flood, but this speculation is driven solely by the need to defend global flood theology. Nothing is said in the biblical text regarding new Nephilim being spawned after the Genesis 6 reference. In fact, as I demonstrated previously, we can't be entirely certain what the Nephilim actually were. If they were the hybrid children of fallen angels and human beings, they could certainly have spawned again during another such encounter. On the other hand, if they were non-Adamic humans, then the only option we have left is direct descent, which can only mean that not everyone was killed in the flood. Now, as I'm sure many of you will probably already know, there are many ancient catastrophic flood accounts, including many in the ancient Near East. And in a number of these accounts, someone is chosen to survive the flood, someone roughly correlating to the biblical Noah. But there are also mentions of other people surviving the great deluge. Interestingly enough, Josephus, who is often appealed to by uh, Jewish and Christian scholars, Josephus was a Jewish Roman historian living in the first century who is famous for chronicling the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. In his, first, in his book Antiquities, in the first chapter, Josephus writes about the flood and mentions that the ark came to rest in the mountains of Armenia and that this was well known at that time. And he writes concerning a man named Nicholas of Damascus who wrote about this in his 96th book and quotes him as saying this, quote, There is a great mountain in Armenia, over Minyas called Baris, upon which it is reported that many who fled at the time of the deluge were saved and that one who was carried in an ark came on shore upon the top of it, and that the remains of the timber were a great while preserved. This might be the man about whom Moses, the legislator of the Jews, wrote." Unquote. I thought you might be interested in uh, hearing that tidbit there from Josephus in mentioning that some people are rumored to have survived the deluge, and this was known in ancient times, so it's not something that was created today by compromisers or any such thing as you often hear. Now, I don't offer this mention of the Nephilim as proof of a regional flood that targeted only a certain segment of humanity. The text is entirely too vague on the matter for us to draw such conclusions with any degree of certainty. I simply submit that it may be evidence of a regional event that killed some people and left others alive. It's just something worth considering. Now, with regard to the question of a regional flood, young earth creationists will usually ask, why didn't God just have Noah move somewhere else for a while while he killed the inhabitants of the land after he was gone? Now, this is a perfectly reasonable question. It's one that I asked when I was a young earth creationist, and I believe it has a perfectly reasonable answer. The biblical record demonstrates that God usually delivers his people through circumstances rather than from them. In this way, he draws distinctions between his people and those around them, and more clearly demonstrates his power to protect and judge. Perhaps the most notable instance of this tendency is his protection of the children of Israel from the plagues of Egypt while they were living in the land of Goshen. Note the words God gave Moses to speak to Pharaoh on that occasion. This is Exodus chapter 8, verses 21 to 23. For if you are not going to let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and on your servants and on your people and into your houses. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people are living, so that no swarms of flies will be there, in order that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. I will put a division between my people and your people. Another famous example of this sort of thing is the story of the three Hebrews who were thrown into Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace after denying the king's order to worship before his idol. God could have spared them this entirely, but by delivering them through the situation, to the extent that their hair was not singed and they did not even smell of smoke when they emerged, Nebuchadnezzar and his top officials were witness to the power of the true God and gave glory to him. You can read about this in Daniel 3, verses 24 and 30. Among other examples we might also consider here are the miraculous victories God permitted Israel in her wars with the Canaanite tribes, David's defeat of Goliath, and Christ's deliverance of his disciples from a storm on the Sea of Galilee. In the same way God delivered his people through these situations, he also protected Noah and his family through the judgment that fell on the ungodly land in which they lived, thereby drawing a distinction between his people and the people of rebellion and leaving an example for future generations. But then why did God have Noah take animals on the ark as well, it may be asked. Wouldn't they just have migrated back into the area after the flood was over? Well, in time, yes, they would have. This may have taken a great deal of time, however, especially for them to arrive in any real numbers, and particularly if the flood covered a vast region. In the meantime, Noah and his family would have been left with little in the way of food, and no beast of burden helped them get life started again. It is also possible that certain species peculiar to the region would have been wiped out entirely had Noah not taken them on the ark.
It's also worth noting here that the flood that Christ compared the flood of Noah to the time of his own second coming. And we can learn some things from this. Now, Jesus speaking in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, says this, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. The comparison Christ draws here is obviously intended to warn his audience against complacency in the last days, lest they be swept away by the judgment of God just as those of Noah's day were. That said, however, there may be one other consideration for us to think on here as well. Just as many Christians read the language of the Genesis flood and take the terms used there to mean that the whole world was flooded and everything that wasn't on the ark died, so they also read various eschatological passages and assume that the events of the Great Tribulation will involve the entire world and no one apart from Christians and godly Jews will survive the second coming. For instance, Revelation chapter 8 verse 7 says that when the first angel sounded his trumpet, fire and hail mingled with blood were thrown down to the earth, with the effect that a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and a third of the green grass was burned up. Now, at first glance, this really does sound like a third of the planet will be devastated by a fiery judgment, and that's usually how many Christians view it. But the Greek word used here, which is ge, is similar to the Hebrew word heretz in that it can simply refer to dry land or to a particular region or nation. An example of this is Matthew 2.21, where, following the death of Herod, Joseph takes Jesus and Mary and returns from Egypt to the ge of Israel, the land of Israel. Thus, Revelation 8-7 may simply be a reference to a judgment that falls on one-third of the territory controlled by the biblical Antichrist, rather than on the whole world. Now, prophecy teachers often give the impression that this Antichrist will rule the whole world, but this is extremely problematic given passages indicating that his power will be based on a confederation of ten nations, and that he will make war with neighboring powers. If Antichrist rules the whole world, how is it that there are nations apparently outside of his influence, with military forces of their own capable of opposing him? Again, when we read terms like Earth in Scripture, we mustn't automatically assume they refer to the entire planet. Even more significant, however, are certain Old Testament passages clearly indicating that some people will in fact survive the Great Tribulation and the Second Coming, apart from Christians and Jews. Zechariah 14 is one such passage. After describing the coming of the Lord to fight for Israel and the plague that will strike the armies that attack Jerusalem at the time of Armageddon, the text goes on to say this, Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that came up against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of armies, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of armies, there will be no rain on them. That's Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 17. Another passage indicating this is Isaiah 66, 18 to 19. After describing his coming to execute judgment on humanity, the Lord says this, For I know their works and their thoughts. The time is coming to gather all the nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. And I will put a sign among them and send survivors from them to the nations, Tarshish, Put, Lud, Meshach, Tubal, and Yavan, to the distant coastlands that have neither heard of my fame nor seen my glory. So, in light of these things, it is po how is it possible that following the Great Tribulation and the Second Coming of Christ, there could be survivors of the nations, and even people groups who have never encountered the Lord at all? It is eminently possible. If the events primarily impact only a particular region of the globe, the land of promise, that is, and the wider Middle East, and if some of the language used in describing the events is hyperbole similar to what we've seen in other passages throughout this study of creation issues. Now, I go into all of this here to suggest the following. The descriptive language used in the flood account that has convinced so many Christians that the flood covered the whole world and that no one apart from Noah and his family survived is identical to the type of language used in eschatological passages that appear to teach that no one apart from Christians and godly Jews will survive the Great Tribulation, the Second Coming, and the Battle of Armageddon. Yet, as I have shown, there are passages that do indicate that some will, in fact, survive these events. Given these similarities in language, and given that Christ himself drew a comparison between the flood and the events surrounding his return, it is at least possible that the judgment of the flood was also limited in scope, and that people living outside of Noah's land survived it. 
Remember the passages I quoted previously that establish that there will be a distinction between the land of Israel, the blessed land, and the areas surrounding it, and the rest of the world during the kingdom age. Now, another question that's often asked by global flood advocates is why fossils of marine organisms have been found on mountains if the flood was not global in extent. So here we're getting into a little bit of science. Now, this question is easily answered. Throughout the planet's history, tectonic activity has raised and lowered topography all over the Earth. Mountainous areas today where such fossils are found were once underwater and were lifted up over time to the heights they currently occupy. But you may ask, isn't that exactly what global flood advocates believe? No, global flood advocates believe that the fossil record was deposited in one event and that the mountains were elevated during a very brief amount of time, less than a year in fact. On the other hand, mainstream scientists believe that fossils were laid down in successive ages and that the mountains were elevated over long periods of time given how slowly tectonic plates move in the crust of the earth. Again, I point out that there is no indication of earth changes in the Genesis flood narrative itself. In fact, the slow retreat of the waters and the depth at which the ark came to rest argue against it. Furthermore, if the flood of Noah were responsible for creating and depositing the entire fossil record, or virtually the entire fossil record, we would expect to find animals of every variety buried together in mass graves, right along with humans. So if humans and dinosaurs were coexisting at that time, we should find Farmer Brown lying next to his pigs and his sheep and all those sorts of things, right along with T-Rex and Stegosaurus and Pterodactyls and all of these animals that supposedly lived at the same time, buried in mass graves with one another. But in point of fact, we don't find this. Dinosaur fossils, for instance, are found only beneath the KT boundary layer, which represents what scientists call the Cretaceous Paleogene Extinction Event Boundary. Human remains are never found beneath this boundary line. No human artifacts are found beneath this line. Why? What are the odds that a chaotic global flood event would selectively bury certain classes of organisms entirely separate from others and then pile geologic strata on top of them in an orderly fashion? I heard someone once say that if the global flood is true, then it was the most OCD flood in the history of the world, and I think they've got a point with that. Now, I'll touch on one other issue here just very briefly. Whenever news comes out about the discovery of an ancient forest or animals that appear to have died off quickly, especially if it looks like they were buried in a mudslide or by some sort of water action, it's not uncommon to see young earth teachers proclaim more evidence of a global flood or something like, scientists are finally catching up with the Bible that there was a worldwide flood very recently. You hear things like that all the time. Now, there have been numerous extinction events in Earth's history, including some that occurred quite suddenly, the most famous being the aforementioned Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, which ended the reign of the dinosaurs. Geologists have also uncovered copious amounts of evidence that there have been numerous large-scale flood events throughout the Earth's history. You have incidents like uh, the flooding that's taken place in cycles at Lake Missoula. You have the Mediterranean Sea going dry and then flooding. You have the uh, Black Sea flood that took place, I believe, close to the end of the last ice age, if I remember correctly. You have all sorts of events like this, and you have other floods created by uh, tsunamis, some of those driven by underwater earthquakes or asteroid strikes or volcanism, that sort of thing. So there have been numerous floods throughout the history of this planet. Scientific models predict this, and the evidence is consistent with it. So it's not enough by half for global flood advocates to demonstrate evidence of flooding around the globe in ancient times. If they're going to prove their case, they must somehow prove that the flooding and die-offs they offer into evidence all stem from just one event that took place only a few thousand years ago. Now, this is a tall order, it's a huge order, and to date, no one has managed it. In conclusion here, while the language of the Genesis Flood may seem on the surface to describe a deluge that inundated the entire world and killed every life form that wasn't aboard the Ark, this conclusion stems from approaching the text with a modern scientific mindset in which the concept of Earth is inseparable from the concept of the globe. When we look into the underlying Hebrew and compare the phraseology of the flood narrative to similar phraseology used elsewhere in scripture, however, the global flood interpretation suddenly seems far less compelling. Various clues in scripture, such as the limiting of the oceans in Psalm 104 and the continuance of the Nephilim, suggest a judgment that was limited in scope and did not kill everything or everyone on the planet. 
Furthermore, the details of the flood account do not describe the sort of tectonic upheaval mandated by global flood theology. The ark runs aground on land that does not appear to be much higher in elevation than the surrounding territory, and the water drains more slowly than we would expect if there had been a dramatic change in the heights of the mountains or the depths of the ocean basins. The ark was not built to survive global tectonic wave action, and it's almost inconceivable that the passengers on the ark could have experienced the same sort of earth changes theorized by global flood advocates and made no mention of them in the account, nor of a great ice age that began afterward. We are simply told that the flood waters rose, inundating the land, and later receded, uncovering the land, nothing more and nothing less. And once again, I would encourage you to go back and look at the clips I showed you from those Young Earth Creationist documentaries on the flood and just ask yourself, given what they think must have happened and how violent this must have been with these hyper tsunamis and all the, this horrible wave action that must have taken place in a global flood with all these earth changes going on. Would a wooden ship, a simple wooden ship have been able to survive all of that? Now, I know some young earth creationists will almost immediately invoke miracles here and say, well, God must have supernaturally protected them. But when you get to the purpose of the ark, it must have been adequate for what was coming. The instructions that God gave the ark, for instance, coating it within and without with pitch to keep the water out. God wasn't going to miraculously keep the water out himself. He told Noah to build a ship that would preserve himself, his family, and the animals that he took aboard it. So it must have been sufficient in and of itself. And this global flood model that young earth creationists are promoting, just, I don't see how any wooden ship could survive that. And others have criticized it on that same basis. But a much more mild local or regional flood, such as I've been talking about here, such as seems consistent with the biblical text, that would be much more manageable, much more survivable. Basically, again, all the ark had to do was float for a while. So I would really encourage young earth creationists who embrace this global flood model to think about that for a little bit and ask themselves, well, why would God have Noah built a boat that was inadequate to survive what was coming? Why would he have had to miraculously intervene? And if we're going to say that he did, why isn't it mentioned anywhere in the text? Or should we think that maybe there's a problem with the way that we perceive the flood and the assumptions that we're reading into the text? And frankly, I think that's a whole lot more plausible. In the final analysis, as I've said previously, global flood theology is really driven by the need for young earth teachers to account for scientific data that is contrary to their interpretations of scripture, particularly death before the fall of man. The text itself does not mandate a global flood. In fact, the regional flood interpretation makes much more sense in light of both the scriptural details and the scientific evidence. Well, thank you once again for uh, taking the time to watch this presentation. This one has been a long one, but I think it's one of the more important ones in this series because it deals again with an issue that is of supreme importance to young earth theology and the overall scientific case that they're trying to make. So I thought it was worth going into this in great detail. I hope it's been of benefit to you. Now, in the next episode of this series, which will be the last regular episode, the last really uh, topical episode, I'm going to go into some evidences for an old earth, an old cosmos. I uh, made it my emphasis in this series just to stick with, uh, for the most part, analyzing scripture. That's been the heavy emphasis there. I haven't done much with science. For one thing, I'm not a credentialed scientist, and I'm not uh, qualified to get very deeply into that. But there are some evidences of an old cosmos that I think will make sense to a lay audience. There are some things that I think most people can understand when they're laid out. And that's what I'm going to try to do. I'm also going to get back to the flood by looking at a young earth creationist book entitled Thousands, Not Billions. Uh, this is a book that came out, I believe, in the early 2000s. At least that's when I became aware of it. It was released with... A great deal of fanfare, young earth creationists were going back and re-examining uh, rocks that had been dated at multi-millions of years and they were going to see, does it all hold up under scrutiny and what are we going to find? And it was interesting and I think it had to be very disappointing for many. And to be honest, as I'll go into in that video, when I finished reading that book, basically I could hear the last nail being hammered into the young earth creationist coffin as far as I was concerned. So we're going to get into that and I'm going to show you again the extremes that young earth creationists go to, young earth creationist organizations that is, uh, the extremes they go to 
to try to build the case that they need to sustain their interpretation of Scripture. And again, that's what it comes down to. So thank you again for your time and attention. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. That makes it more visible for others uh, searching for similar content on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel if you're so inclined and share the content as far and wide as you please. If you'd like to donate to support the channel, there's a link to that below. And until next time, God bless.